We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome back to another episode of the California Golden Bearcast, a proud partner of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. It's been a minute, listeners. Um, we've been Andy and I have been trying to nail down uh, some things to to get out to you folks, but um, Andy isn't here today. If you've already read the description for the pod, um, he is busy being a uh, dad to a newborn. Um, so congratulations to Andy and and Di. Um, She's. I've heard she's doing great. Andy sends me pictures of his daughter all the time. Um, she is absolutely adorable, and I can't wait to meet her. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm here with some right for California basketball expert <coughs> analyses extraordinaires for today. Because we're going to talk about Mark Madsen. We're going to talk about the hire. We'll probably give about five minutes to Mark Fox's <laughs> tenure here and retrospective. But I got with me Nick. Terrence, and of course, the man who was in the press box all year, Mr. Don. Hello. Hey, hey. Hey, hey Rob. All right, guys. I'm Mark to I, Mark. We just got to get right into this, right? We got we got to talk about Mark Fox. We got to talk about his his tenure here. Nick, you have you wrote the retrospective on Mark Fox probably like a year ago, and you kept adjusting it because we kept thinking that he could get fired next month. He could get fired next month. He could get fired next month. I, um, honestly, I've been writing it in my head for four years. <laughs> like, I think we all knew it was coming, and it was just a question of when. Uh, you know, I think I've said my piece, so I'll I'll, I'll let uh, Terry and Don have their say. I think uh, one of the things that I really thought about Fox is it wasn't just his inability to win and his dinosaur era offense. It was sort of more that. He was unwilling to take a critical look at himself and the team and say, you know, this isn't working. How can we change this? Um, He never really adjusted to the modern era of college basketball, whether that's, you know, courting um, uh, high level transfers, whether that's really embracing the NIL challenge and or, you know, really looking at, you know, a modern basketball offense. Yeah, you know, whether that's that's look, looking for more efficient ways to score from the three point line, or you know not throwing it to Lars at the elbow every single play, so I think <laughs> it wasn't really that. Like you know, I think when when Fox got hired, we were skeptical, but we were willing to give him a little bit of leash because you know he, even though he didn't have a bunch of success, he had had a few uh, decent teams at Georgia and especially at Nevada, but. You know, first year, second year doesn't work, and he, you know, he spends a lot of time blaming other factors besides ones that are in his control. And I think we were more disappointed in like his inability to adjust what he was doing. Uh, well, personally, for me, like I feel like if the process is right and we're still coming out poorly on win loss, that's one thing. But I, it felt like he was very stubborn about the way he went about his business. Uh, I don't know what you thought, Don. Well, yeah, 
to that point, he had roster challenges this year. Injuries, everything did hamper him. Um, but he used that as the ultimate excuse of everything. So when pressed a couple times at some of the uh, post-game conferences of like, that worked for three minutes when you tried to do that thing. Did you think about doing that more? He would always say, well, we can't because we're roster limited. Um, and that was always... It's an excuse, but not an excuse, I think, to the extreme that he was pushing that narrative on never trying anything slightly different, uh, so risk adverse to get away from that high-low game with Lars, to try to change it up a little bit, to try to go up tempo, because the roster was always limited. And that was always the answer that he was going to give to almost every single question. I think, you know, really... Uh, Terry, your, your point is sort of... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say... Your point is sort of interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, Nick, go. go. Yeah, Nick, go ahead. <laughs> I thought your point was sort of interesting because I was sort of thinking back across the four years of Mark Fox and trying to think at what point did he ever try anything different? Like, I don't, I never saw a change in recruiting strategy. I certainly, we never saw a shakeup of assistant coaches. We never saw a change in X's and O's on the court. I, now that I think about it in retrospect, I can't recall a single thing that he ever tried to do to be different, to change it from year to year, game to game. Um, it, it started out old fashioned and it only got more and more old fashioned as everybody else tried new things and we just stayed the same. That's a good point. Yeah, I was going to mention, uh, aside from you know, the, the Stanford win this year, I thought the best half of basketball we played this year was the second half of the Kansas State game. And a lot of that was coming back against, you know, what ended up being a very good Kansas State team, although we didn't know it at the time. And because of some roster limitations or foul trouble, he was forced into an up-tempo, uh, you know, guard and, and wing-oriented offense. And we came all the way back and made it a game within the last five minutes against a very, very good Kansas State team. Yeah. You know, you think of a coach that was flexible or, 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 you know, at least would take a look at is like, Hey, we played really well for this half of basketball. Even if we lost, what if we played, you know, 20 minutes a game using this up tempo, you know, defense first, uh, you know, fast break style. But I think we never really went to that until he was forced by, you know, whenever Lars or ND or both of them would get into foul trouble and we'd have to go with, um, you know, Grant Newell as our big. Right. I like to me. It was the uh, UW game up in uh, the overtime loss against uh, the Huskies, where how you attack that Hopkins zone, you you a lot of motion across the center and look for those open soft spots. So you had Joel Brown attacking like crazy. You had that was almost a Grant Newell coming out game, right? Where he I think he finished with around twenty and ten, and it was just that motion that okay, this is how we attack. We just we find those spots within that Hopkins zone and it worked. And, you know, we arguably should have won that in regulation and overtime too. But that's to your point. Like there were moments there where you go, why don't you do that more? And, and I, yeah, probably you're right. Nick in hindsight, four years, it was the same thing over and over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I wrote an article like two years ago where it was talking about after year one, where all of a sudden the first or second game, we're shooting a lot more threes. And I'm like, oh, is this is this us turning it around? Like, are we going modernized basketball here? And then that article was literally worth one game. <laughs> and then it, it reverted. It reverted back to whatever, whatever it was. Um, I think all your guys's points are just makes so much. It just makes a lot of sense if you look back at it. Right. And I think for me. The thing that irked me, even when we've hired Fox, was like his his name dropping was just really, really just like you shouldn't need to name drop Van Gundy or all these coaches or Coach K or all these names of of prominent co collegiate basketball coaches um, that you supposedly spent time with um, during his year off from basketball and talking about how much he learned about the game and how it's like becoming or modernizing and it just gave him like a new perspective on the sport only to come here and for four years do exactly what you've been doing the past 10. Like it, so it just, it never made sense to me. It felt so, yeah, it felt just so much of a, here's, here's these famous people I know. Um, and I got to spend time with who knows if like, you know, 
he actually really spent quality time with those those coaches and, and people. But like it was that's that's the one thing that always just never sat right with me. Um, I, so I mean, <laughs> so to close, like my retrospective on Mark Fox is I think like by year two, <laughs> I think he kind of just went, I'm not going to win here. I'm going to do I'm going to coach my way out of this it, just to get to respectable. And he was just blinded by his own ambition of being wanting to be able to do that. And it just went downhill, 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 downhill until we ended up with his firing on March 9th. I've learned so much in my year away from basketball. <laughs> and we shoot threes at the 339th fewest rate in the NCAA in his first year at Cal. Uh, you, you really learned a lot. You're a year away from the court, Mark. <laughs> All right. I think that's enough about Mark Fox. We got to talk about another Mark we just hired. <laughs> How could, it's it's yeah, it writes itself. These jokes write themselves at this point. Um, I'm gonna run through just the timeline of what happened and just the process, and then we can get into a bit of the Mark Madsen stuff. Uh, but I also got wanted to get your guys' thoughts on the hiring cycle that went around this time. So on March 9th, Mark Fox is officially fired. 38 and 87 record at Cal, 17 and 61 in conference play, three straight 20 loss seasons. Uh, Jim Knowlton writes, I wanted to thank Mark for his unwavering commitment to our men's basketball program. He led the team through some challenging times and always did so with the class and professionalism we have come to expect from him. Mark understood and embraced our university's mission and ideals and was always an exemplary representative of our department. I wish him the best of luck in the future. This was not a difficult. This uh, this was not a difficult decision. This was a difficult decision, <laughs> and one that I do not take lightly. After deliberating and holistically evaluating all aspects of our program, I felt a change was needed at this time. We will always be guided by the best interests of our student athletes as well as the values of our university. That happens on March 9th. March eighteenth and nineteenth, uh, G- University of California, Santa Barbara head coach Joe Pasternak and Kennesaw State head coach Amir Abdurrahim rumored to be involved with the open position here at Cal. March 21st, Mark Spears of ESPN uh, reports that Amir Abdurrahim interviewed over Zoom for the Cal head coach position. March 22nd, Jeff Schultz of The Athletic reports that uh, Amir Abdurrahim is not a serious candidate for the position. On the 24th, Kirk Bowles of the Austin American Statesman reports Cal is interested in the interim Texas Longhorns head coach, Rodney Terry. March 24th, Randy Bennett reportedly looking to sign a new deal at SMU, not interested in the Cal gig, and that was, I believe, by Jeff Goodman. March 25th, Joe Pasternak's contract extension with UCSB was announced, taking him essentially out of the running for the Cal men's basketball position. March 26th, Mark Madness emerging as leading candidate for Cal gig, reported by John Rothstein. And on March 29th, Madsen is officially hired the day after Utah Valley loses to UAB in the NIT semifinals in overtime. Gentlemen, your take on the hiring cycle search and all that went on over legitimately a month. So in hindsight... It's. It, I, I'm. I'm realizing looking back, like we had our big board one, big board two. We all threw around names, discussion forms, etc. And we're picking everybody who's a hot name after the NC2A win here or there. Um, but it, you know, even Rodney Terry, when I look back, that made sense to reach out to him because he has Fresno State ties and West Coast ties. It was always going to be a West Coast guy, right? So the Amir thing, when I go, why didn't we even necessarily talk to him? I look back and go, well, were you ever going to pull him away from the South? And it doesn't necessarily tap into potentially the West Coast ties that you're looking for. So obviously, Pasternak makes sense. Uh, Randy Bennett makes sense. Rodney Terry with Fresno State ties makes sense. Um, but I think it makes sense looking back, like we didn't necessarily go after Ryan Odom ever or, you know, Darian DeVries or any of those potentially other mid-major names that you would think we'd go after who's always going to be a West Coast guy. And that's why you had Pat Croy from Cal Baptist, uh, Stan Johnson, right? I mean, West Coast to the extreme, uh, in hindsight, it makes sense, um, and I think this is going to be okay. With I, I don't mind the un- out the uh, end result of getting Madsen, but I think there probably could have been a, little, a, t- a few tweaks along the way to kind of make it maybe more obvious. It was always going to be a West Coast guy. All right, I'll be done for now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm curious. One of the things that we can never know is who who else that they maybe would have considered like. For all we know, 
the athletic department might have called up Ryan Odom, and Ryan said, I am not touching three and 28 radioactive cow with a, a three foot pole. <laughs> I have better options available to me. No thanks. And then we immediately move on. So, you know, it, it would be really fascinating to know who else we maybe reached out to, but it was immediately clear that they had no interest in the Cal job. And so we moved on to the folks who did. Um, I, so we can then, we can talk about the people that we know for sure had some level of interest, presumably based on the reporting, which is of course Madsen, but then Stan Johnson with Loyola Marymount, um, Amir Abdul Rahim with Kennesaw State, Joe Pasternak with UCSB, and that's probably it. I mean, they, they made their Hail Mary throw at Randy Bennett, which is absolutely something you should do, even though the likely result is that you get Randy a few extra million dollars from St. Mary's. Um, what, and again, we don't know who else they may have gone after. Um, all of those are credible candidates, except for, in my opinion, Stan Johnson. Um, I don't know how seriously Cal considered him, but apparently they interviewed him and we don't know maybe how much Stan Johnson's agents were throwing his name out there to try to get a raise out of Loyola Marymount. I hope that Cal wasn't really seriously considering a guy who's under 500 in West Coast Conference play across a few seasons. Um, when, But they got a guy better than Stan Johnson, so I can't be too upset about the, li the potential interest they might have showed in him. So the question really becomes is... Mark Madsen, the best candidate out of the three of himself, Amir Abdul Rahim, and Joe Pasternak. And I think ultimately, they, the three of them have similar uh, enough resumes at lower conference schools, their own pluses and minuses that I think reasonable minds could kind of disagree on which is the best option. And I think it's hard to get too upset over picking one over any of the others. But, you know your guys' thoughts on which of the three you would have preferred, I'd certainly be interested to hear. I think, um, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on, on how you feel about things, in 2023, you have to not only look at the basketball resume and acumen, but also the money side of the equation. And not I'm not talking about the salary, I'm talking about NIL. And so I think that's a, a, a separate discussion you know, where apparently Coach Pasternak had already had, you know, NIL donors ready to pitch in on his behalf, and you know, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's sort of a, a fact of modern college basketball that that has to be factored into um, the decision making, and you know, I think personally, um, out of the three, you know. Because I, I can't speak very much to the NIL stuff because um, I don't have a lot of personal knowledge. But on the basketball side, I like that Mark, you know, obviously has what a decade of experience in pro basketball, both as a coach and as a player. And so the uh, the ability to switch on the fly in terms of looking at modernization of what we're doing and you know some of the stuff we saw Utah Valley running. Um, in terms of like high pick and rolls, you know, immediate dive, like dive, you know, dive right off the, the pick um, basketball, that looked really attractive. Like, you know, people were looking to take shots in the first 10 seconds of the shot clock. So I really like the style that Madsen brings. And I think, you know, he's young enough that he can, he still, he still has a lot of pro cachet. You know, he was teammates with Kobe. He was teammates with Shaq. Uh, but he's also built up a lot of college, um, you know, reputation and results as well. So for me, his resume reads the best um, out of those three basketball wise. Yeah, I'm with you, Nick um, and Terrence. Like, there's shades of gray between those three. Um, I was actually a little more enamored with uh, Amir Abdur Rahim because I like that up tempo push. Um, I like the yearly pitch about having an African-American coach and being the first one in the Pac-12 um, uh, as, you know, in addition to the basketball acumen as well. Um, uh, but I have no issues ending up with Madsen, to your point. You know, he's got the cachet both uh, with a pro playing and coaching resume and college experience, too. Um, good at developing big men, right? That's yeah. the supposed rumor, right? What he's done at Utah Valley and Kirk Kurtwell. 
knock on wood, we have a roster full of wings because we've been talking about this all year. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how he changes to whatever roster he ends up with after the transfer portal. And if he goes after coachable big men, because that's what his uh, you know primary knowledge set is, or I'm going to be interesting to see how he potentially evolves whatever the roster looks like. And yeah. I think he can, unlike unlike the prior regime, which was inflexible. I'm I'm I'm, Matt's yeah. and I expect to be flexible. Yeah. Um, one other thing I'll throw out there about the process before we move on to like em- embracing the future and having some semblance of hope again. Um, I do wonder how toxic this becomes the the process, just because everybody kind of hates Jim Knowlton now. Like, like I think well before he fired Mark Fox and, and, and engaged in this coaching search, I think most Cal fans have decided that Jim Knowlton is a problem that they would prefer to not have at Cal anymore for whatever reason you might have. Maybe you think he isn't giving football the resources it needs. Maybe you think he gave Mark Fox too long of a leash. Maybe uh, you have issues with how he handled the McKeever situation. Regardless, there are a lot of people with a lot of problems with Knowlton. And I think because everybody sort of already has their preconceived notions, they're ready to assume the worst about how he handled the search, even if the, everybody's okay with the results. So like how he handled uh, outreach to the former players, how he handled outreach to donors. There's a lot of people ready to have hurt feelings because they don't trust him. And I think that's the real problem in Cal athletics right now is that we have an athletic director that people don't trust and I don't think that you can salvage that. And we need to get somebody in that position that people do trust, that they do trust providing money to, that they believe will be good stewards of their donations. That is a bigger problem than what we're here to talk about on this podcast. But I think it's worth <laughs> mentioning that, that w- when you've lost faith in someone, I, I, it's really hard to, to earn that back. Hi, maybe hiring Mark Madsen ends up being a good move, but I don't think in and of itself, it's going to get people convinced that Jim Knowlton is the right man for the Cal athletic director job. Yeah, you're right. There's no benefit of the doubt, right? Everything is like Mike Montgomery had too much of a voice. We just, you know, everything's, everything is uh, um, glass half empty versus potentially glass half full on every single micro decision um, where you would give a little bit of grace potentially if there was goodwill. Um, but unfortunately, like you said, everything is uh, viewed negatively, even if the outcome turns out to be excellent um everybody's going to scrutinize in a bad way or negative way um, all the microwaves because yeah there is some toxicity around that name right now yeah i think yeah i oh, mean go ahead rob no no go ahead uh, i was gonna say even you know like i i think you know the way Knowlton is handled um you know the COVID situation which you know leads into sort of the undeserved extensions of, of uh, some major sport coaching and as well as, you know, uh, losing some of the, the win loss percentages of, of some of the, our Olympic sports. I think that aside, you know, I think there's a lot of even trying to give him credit for fixing the finances of the sports, the athletic department, which were in terrible shape, you know, uh, after uh, Sandy and even if he brought that around, nobody's willing to give him that credit because, you know, of how poorly things have happened over the last five years. And there's no way of rescuing that either. There's nothing that he can do to bring that back around. Even if, you know, we, you know, for some odd reason, end up going to a bowl game and getting back to the tournament, I, I think those accomplishments will be viewed in spite of Knowlton rather than credit to Knowlton. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, the only thing I was going to say is on this is like we, you know, just going off of what Don was saying, the narrative is so easy to we could have written these narrative stories super easy if we had hired any of the other two guys um, that were mentioned. Right. Like if Amir was hired, we'd be like, look, it's Sharif's brother. It was an easy decision to make. Like if Sharif sold him on, on the school and and we got him back involved, like this is that. It's a no-brainer for Knowlton to hire him. If Pasternak was hired, we could have just we, we would easily would have said, like, look, that's the name that has been floated around for years. We couldn't get anyone better, so we just settled with Pasternak. Like, 
it's it's so easy for us to be able to just because of covering this team and knowing how these how the basic trend of fan voices has been over the last like three years we know exactly how the fan reaction would have been what if we had hired anyone like the madsen one i think is the one now where some people are coming around on it but they're still not giving Knowlton the credit for for hiring the dude um you know as as don said you know it's like maybe it was montgomery who who had too much influence in this or or whatever whatnot but um hey he's our coach now and so I think it's best that uh, we talk about him unless any of you guys have anything uh, you more want to say on this uh, Jim Knowlton and the hiring yeah. process. Let's, let's look to the future. <laughs> let's look to the future. <laughs> Fire Jim Knowlton. All right. Mark Madsen was officially hired today on the 29th. His official unveiling is, uh, I believe, Monday. Um, also, the reason being, I believe his wife is um, – or they're expecting – their fourth child um, and was supposed to be any day. Now there were rumors of him, you know, deciding whether he wanted to coach the game against UAB or be there with his wife on the off chance that she was uh, due. And, but he was there at the game and now, you know, he's probably back um, with the family getting ready for that. So that's probably why they pushed it off to, to next week. Plus, you know, no one's on campus right now, so it's probably a good reason to Spring push it week. off to yep. next week. Yep. So, uh, he's hired. Let me run you through a couple of things. Uh, we got some quotes from the athletic department from a bunch of people. Steve Nash, Mark Madsen is an incredible human being. He has a tremendous amount of passion for the game and his players along with remarkable character. I'd be ecstatic to have a son play for him and work with him daily. Mark D'Antoni, two-time NBA coach of the year. Mark is one of the brightest coaches in college basketball. Besides his basketball knowledge, the thing that sets Mark apart is high moral character. He'll be a fantastic representative of the Cal family. Luke Walton, who was his head coach um, when Mark Madsen was hired to the Lakers. Mark is one of the hardest, uh, most knowledgeable, hardest working, most knowledgeable coaches I have ever had the pleasure of working with. His attention to detail, his passion for the game, and his ability to teach have led him to great success as a coach. On top of that, he's a great man, great friend, and parents will be lucky to have him help lead their kids. Um, also, Robert Ori, Mark was not just my teammate, but my friend. I'm excited to witness all of his success, both playing and coaching the game. Jason Collins, um, one of his Stanford teammates, Mark Madsen, is one of the best human beings I've ever had met. I was lucky to be teammates with him in college where he consistently demonstrated leadership, hustle, and true friendship each and every day. And lastly, Rick Fox, another uh, Lakers great. Mark was the teammate that every championship level team must have on it, a player with boundless focus and energy coupled with a high basketball IQ and a willingness to sacrifice for his teammates and the greater team goal. Some people call those players the goo player. I call it the heart and soul of any successful team. Look, now we have a men's basketball coach whose <coughs> most famous gif is him dancing pretty <laughs> terribly on a stage. And we have a football coach whose most notable gif is licking his lips on the sideline of a football game. We probably are the most gifable two head coaches in uh, the Power Five now. But. Life goals. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish Wilcox were that consistently gifable. I, I, sadly, I think the, the lip, lip, lick lip uh, implied more uh, high level personality, maybe, than we actually get from, from low key Justin. Low key Justin, that's right. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say before I drop it off to you guys just some Utah Valley stats from this past season. Ken Palm had him ranked as the 64th best team in the country. They barely missed out on the tournament because um, they won their league in the regular season, but lost to Southern Utah um, in the uh, the WAC tournament. So they ended up in the NIT. They got to the semifinals, as I said, and they lost to UAB in the final four last night. Um, some numbers for you. Their adjusted efficiency on offense is 107.9, which is 119th in the country. Defense is 95.3, which is 29th in the country. Tempo, 70.2. That means an average of 70.2 possessions uh, per 40 minutes. And uh, average possession length on offense is 17.1 seconds, which is 116th in the country. Their effective field goal percentage on offense was 51.7%. On defense, 440 And then some of the more notable stats is um, on defense – 
they gave up a 42.8 two point percentage, which is bet, which is good for third in the entire country and 31.3 from beyond the arc, which was good for 35th in the country. They don't shoot a lot of threes. They only shot at 32.8% of their total field goals, uh, but still higher than, uh, than what we were shooting. <laughs> and uh, that's about it. Um, I give it up to you guys. I know most of us watched the, the Utah Valley game last night and we came away with some thoughts from it, but uh, we'll just go in a circle and, would anyone like to start? Well, I will say that Utah Valley had the same number of Pac-12 wins as Cal did <laughs> this past year. We had two, and Utah Valley beat Oregon during the regular season and Colorado during the uh, first round, I believe, of the NIT. So mm-hmm. he's, they're already we're already at least breaking even. I'll say that. <laughs> um, the funny thing is, to me, the storylines write themselves, and I hadn't realized this Um before some of the stuff that came out last couple of days, right? East Coast native. I mean, I knew that, right? But the, you start putting all these together. East Coast native. Um, you mean East Bay? State local. East. Yeah, East Bay, right? So we're San Ramon, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, obviously went to Stanford. I have no idea if he was even recruited by Cal. Um, but just, like I said, all of these things kind of write themselves uh, prominent in the NBA. And I love the Stanford rending of shirts over all of this. Um, I, you know... We talked about storylines with Pasternak and Amir, potentially. The storylines write themselves here with Madsen um, in a good way. Uh, just a local local boy returning home to coach his rivalry, but he knows the territory, knows uh, knows the area, knows what he's getting into, I think. And um, I, am, I am optimistic going forward. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need indeed. So um, what I was sort of thinking about in in terms of like analyzing Madsen is I I wanted to sort of figure out when we put together our first uh, list of potential head coaches that Cal might go after, Madsen did not make the list. And I was sort of trying to figure out why. Um, Because it seems sort of, you know, like in, in retrospect, he was by far the biggest omission from our initial list, mm-hmm. not just because he actually came became Cal's coach, but he does have an intriguing resume that I think sort of flies under the radar. And when I was trying to make sure that we turned over every stone, I went through like literally every single coach of a West Coast conference. So I went through the entire WAC, Mountain West, Big Sky, uh, anything that was remotely like, you know, west of the Great Plains to look at every coach. And Madsen's resume didn't sort of jump off the page at a quick glance, partly because he took over a team from Mark Pope when Mark Pope moved from Utah Valley to BYU. It was already pretty good, and that team took a pretty prominent step back in Madsen's first year. And, you know, they, they took kind of small but significant steps forward each year. And I think probably when we were initially looking at our list, uh, it was early in the season when it was pretty clear that Fox was not going to survive. And, you know, Utah Valley had gotten off to kind of a rough start, and really there wasn't a whole lot that was super intriguing. Um, And I think there's a a few things that I think it was easy for us to overlook. One of those things is that um, I think the main reason that Madsen's team took a big step back in his first year was because the 
Mark Pope's last Utah Valley team had a ton of experience and most of the guys on that team left. And so Madsen really was you know, rebuilding from scratch. Um, and the other thing is that like Madsen's Utah Valley team really picked things up, you know, like kind of late in the non-conference schedule. Um, they had a big upset win over BYU on the road. They knocked off Oregon again on the road after that rough start and then pretty well cruised through a decent whack. And then obviously they've had this impressive NIT run. And so I think a lot of Madsen's appeal now is sort of resting on, I had this four year rebuild. This year was the result of that. Look at what I can achieve if you give me significant time and resources. So I think that's kind of why we overlooked him. Well, I would I mean, argue just... also. No, go ahead. Um, at that time, we also thought Haas was probably going to be out at Stanford. Yeah. yeah. And, and why would we even think about Madsen? Because, you know, when we're putting that list together, like, like you know, December-ish or so at the first pass. Oh, yeah. It's Haas is out and Madsen's. That's the obvious. So let's just move on. Right. Because he was never going to be on our radar because. But Stanford surprised us all, I think, by bringing Jared back for another year. And it's really that's amazing. kind of where I was at. Like, okay, why would I even think about Madsen? Because They're even... it's obvious uh, where he's going to go. <laughs> yeah. Somehow our rivals are the only team even more passive than us. <laughs> it's really, Se- really impressive stuff. <laughs> Seven years with Jared. They do have a five-star recruit coming in, so I, I can um, somewhat understand. And they finished yeah. this easy season pretty well. Yeah, Paige Stojakovic's kid. Yeah, uh, pains me. The um, as Nick wears his Sacramento <laughs> Kings hat. While we're recording Rob, a uh, couple. Uh, oh, one tweet which you didn't read, um, and yeah, this might pain us a little bit, but uh, Coach Dennis Gates, the sheriff. Yeah. He also said, "Congratulates to congrats to Mark Ratson as he enters into the this next chapter of Cal basketball." Yes, he's a Stanford grad. So what? He is a great leader, person, and coach. If you want Cal men's basketball to win, show him and the players unwavering support. I do. Best of luck. And then the the kickers, the last sentence. I can't wait to hear him say "Go Bears." That's right. We we gotta hire Dennis at some point. We the, this is some some like we have to force it to happen at this at this rate. And then and then that's just the, that's just the and then thing. Reef answered that and said, "Couldn't say it better. Go Bears." So I think, right. you know, we're getting a lot of. Su- There's no hard feelings. We're also getting a lot of support from no. our basketball alumni. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure. You know, the one thing I would note is that the first time you'll hear a coach criticize another is going to be another. Is 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 yeah? It's a very <laughs> rare occasion, right? You know, I love Van Gundy on the NBA broadcast, but he has never ever criticized the coach. And I think that's pretty standard across the industry. Um, you know, they may have things to say behind each other's backs, but to the media, you'll never, you very rarely hear one coach criticize another. Yeah. So um, if we're looking at Mark's resume, like what I'm excited about and maybe what concerns me a little bit. Right. Um, The number one thing I'm excited about, like I'm looking, when I look at a a statistical resume, I'm looking for statistical hallmarks. What does a coach care about? What do his teams always do? Bad coaches don't have any because they can't coach their team to do anything with any particular success. Mark Madsen's teams defend two point shots. They do not let you get easy buckets. Um, He came in and immediately got Utah Valley playing good interior defense. They only got better every single season. They were elite this year. He, it's something he clearly cares about. He identifies players that can do that for him and he coaches them to achieve that. Um, They blow, his teams have always blocked a lot of shots. Um, Interestingly though, they also do that without giving up a ton of three point attempts. They're pretty good at suppressing three point attempts. It shows me that he understands bat, uh, defense on a level that maybe a lot of coaches don't necessarily understand. Um, so I think we we're, we should get the coach that we maybe thought we were going to get with Mark Fox. You know, Mark Fox had an okay defensive resume. 
it's tough to compare apples to oranges here with Utah Valley versus Georgia, but like the stats are better here. Um, and so I'm excited to see what Madsen can do defensively. Well, on yeah, the other side of the ball, I've got some concerns about the turnover numbers, which right. might be a factor of like lower level skill players at Utah Valley, but you know, four years of high turnover percentages <clears throat> makes me a little bit nervous on the other side of the ball. It felt like that game last night, and I haven't done a ton of watching the tape. I'll, I'll do that more as the offseason progresses. They were really loose, and I mean that both positively and negatively, right? So fairly loose on the offensive side, good motion, but also loose handling the ball. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple just sloppy miscues of the ball. I, you know, In many ways, I felt they were playing the Vegas here, playing with house money a little bit at the season. They kind of knew what was happening. They were already at the – you know, semifinals of the NIT playing in Vegas. They knew their coach was probably on the way out at that point. And I felt like they were almost just playing almost too loose. It's just fun at that point. Good for them, right? End of a long season is winding down. But, yeah, my impression last night was um, loose on the verge of sloppy. Nice energy. Um, I like the space concepts on the defense. It's one of the things, and probably unfairly here, a lot of what Madsen's going to be compared about, especially – you know, breaking down game tape is he's doing this better than Fox's teams did. So I like the spacing a lot better. Uh, we sometimes are big, especially got lost on defensive spacing. Um, I think he, and that backs up by the stats, he is better at coaching defensive spacing, which allows them to collapse on the ball a little bit more, you know, contest more shots than average. Um, and again, bolstered by all the stats that you just mentioned, Nick. I think, yeah, that's oh. the weird part. It's like, oh yeah. No, uh, uh, I'll, one second. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Terrence. Go I, ahead. I think I'm here to moderate. Just um, uh, going off what Don said about the sort of looseness, I feel like you know, just a personal observation is none of his players, like after making mistakes, looked to the bench as if they were expected to be taken out. And I because <laughs> they're going to be subbed out. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry again, bad comparison. Because because like. And I feel like, you know, on offense, they were really looking for shots, looking to create, looking to get to the basket, whereas it felt like a lot of the, the Fox offenses felt very mechanical. You know, I throw it here and I run to this spot what, rather than sort of seeing where the defense is and, and, you know, where can I make um, a move and, you know, get beat one guy and play five on four. Um, and so I think – that sort of yeah, it felt like Madsen gave his team a lot of the freedom to make mistakes, and mm -hmm. I think if you recruit the right athletes and the right guards and the right players, you know you can live with a high turnover offense if you're also creating easy shots with a high effective field goal percentage. You know, no no team can be perfect in all aspects. So if you're creating, if you have a uh, a high turnover offense where players have a lot of autonomy, but you're also creating really good open shots, whether that's at the rim or open looks at three, you know, where, where players can make sort of make decisions on their own without looking over the shoulder, worried about being pulled. Um, players play a lot more loose and, you know, I'm not comparing us to the warriors, but the warriors are also a super high turnover, uh, Offense because they let you know Steph and Jordan and Draymond cook, and you know, sure you have a lot of really bad turnovers in crucial situations, but you also end up with a lot of wins. So you're going to have to sacrifice play in some places. And it felt to me, you know, I haven't watched a lot of Utah Valley, but it felt to me like Madsen was entrusting a lot of decision making in his team rather than like. Like, I'm going to control everything here from the coach's box. I think that's a fair point. And you can sort of see that in the statistical profile a little bit, where the, the high turnover percentage is counteracted by solid shooting for the most part on their two point shots and a lot of free throws. That, that might be the most consistent statistical hallmark on the offensive side for Madsen is his teams get a lot of free throws. And so I think 
what they're doing is they're doing a lot of, t- of attacking and they're trying to get the ball to the rim, whether that's, you know, high pick and roll, passing, uh, drives. And the result is probably a fair bit of risky passing in an attempt to get that. But when they achieve that, they get high value shots and they draw fouls. And so um, the question is how well he'll balance that out, you know, with, with Pac-12 level athletes, um, though maybe not Pac-12 level athletes that are like, like we'll probably still be at a relative talent disadvantage uh, compared to other Pac-12 teams, at least to start. So we'll see how that plays out at this level. You've had Wendy's Nugs dipped in sauce, but have you had them covered in sauce? Wendy's new saucy nugs take the crispy and spicy nugs you love and turn them up to 11. Choose between flavors like buffalo or honey barbecue, garlic parm, or if you're a real heat seeker out there, you can try spicy ghost pepper only on Wendy's signature spicy nugs. Listen, I'm going to dare you to do it. I dare you. That's seven delicious ways to try the nugs that you already love. Pick a flavor, grab some extra napkins, and then grab a few more napkins and prepare to nug like you've never nugged before. For a whole new way to nug, it's got to be Wendy's at participating U.S. Wendy's. Yeah, I think for me, like the the biggest couple takeaways from watching the game last night is what Don was saying. Like they were playing loose, um, they were throwing lobs. Granted, some of those lobs and alley oop passes were not close on target whatsoever. Right. But the fact that they were still looking for that and being allowed to make those passes was great to see. The looseness, the negative side of that looseness was some of their dribbling. Like they would just pick up their dribble in the the worst possible places um, out of the double teams. And like, right as they see the double, they would pick up their dribble. Um, Even when they were dribbling, there was a lot of times where it's not, it's not tight and compact. It's like ahead of them or like way far out where their arms like fully extended on the dribble. Um, Yeah. It was just, it it didn't look pretty um, at all, but offensively, like one of the, one of the good things is as soon as they get the ball in their hands, they're going to try and make a shot before the defense is set. So they're running into the opposition court. They're pushing it. The bigs know what to do. The wings know what to do. The one play that I really liked was I um, I can't remember if it was off of a turnover or like just right off of a made basket, but they ran it down. They run a high pick and roll off the wing on the left side, and they totally they totally leave. UAB totally leaves the screener alone. So he slips out. The guard throws the pass over the hedger, and he takes two steps in, and then there's a wing player in the opposite weak side corner, and he notices that the center is rotating out. So you see him basket cut right away. Yep. And then that leads to that little pass, like either a bounce pass or a little lob up to him, and that's an easy two. That was – it was natural. Like it was – there was no play call. There was no, like, Madsen wasn't screaming at his point guard to, like, start in this position or calling out for a specific play like Fox used to do. This was just they knew exactly what to do, how they were going to attack it initially off the bat. The flip side and the negative from that was there were a lot of times where their initial or even secondary motions would get stopped. And once they get into the 17, 18, 19 seconds of the shot clock, or more like 11, 12 seconds left in the shot clock, um, the offense kind of just stalls. They don't know what else to do. And there's a lot of there were a lot of bad uh, t- shot clock violations and just random chuck-ups um, towards the end of the shot clocks. That's a concern of mine. If your offense is so heavily predicated on the first 17 seconds of the shot clock but doesn't really know what to do for the remaining 13, um, particularly when you're going to be playing some pretty advanced defenses and, you know, um, athletic talent in the Pac-12. Hopefully that's something that can get fixed, but that was one of the, that was one of the question marks that I had written down after watching the game last night. So that's, that's my take, I guess. uh, Any, anything else on Mark Madsen? Well, looking at the higher, Go for it. Looking at the stats for the last couple of years for Utah Valley, he he runs deep. He likes to run deep. You've had nine players who are average uh, at least 15 minutes a game. 
Um, uh, the stats are fairly balanced. He's obviously got some high performers, but three to five people every year averaging in double figure points. Um, so it's a balanced approach. Uh, a lot of bodies coming and going, helping with that motion facilitation a little bit. Um, I'm going to be happy if we get away from hero ball. Uh, give it to your best player and just get out of the way and hope for the best. Um, so, again, the stats kind of show a much more balanced approach to scoring, um, which I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm a big guy on aesthetics of basketball. I like good when it's pretty. That's why I'm a, probably a bigger Warriors fan than maybe I need to be, just because it looks really nice. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for a return to aesthetically pleasing basketball. I wonder. I think it's also, probably worth oh, yeah. talking through some off the court stuff. Um, yeah. Well, not not off the court, but like, so if we're talking about sort of like what the different candidates bring to the table, right? Um, particularly Pasternak, because I think a lot of people sort of sort of assumed that would be the higher. What Pasternak brings to the table is. Um, many years of high level recruiting on the West coast, like at Cal at Arizona, obviously UCSB. So sort of the assumption was that he would be able to immediately hit the ground running and recruit California. Mm -hmm. What Mark Madsen brings to the table is not necessarily recruiting, not to say that I know or think that he would be a bad recruiter, but he has a lot more MBA coaching experience and, you know, at Utah Valley, he's not necessarily recruiting in the same circles that you would expect him to be recruiting in at the Pac-12 level. So the question is, what's more valuable? Do, like, do you want to have that guy who maybe knows N NBA concepts, has NBA connections, can sell that to Pac-12 recruits? Or would you rather have the guy who already maybe has the connections with AAU basketball and, and California high school coaches? And I don't know if there's a right answer, but, you know, this might be something that we can only grade in 2020 hindsight, but I think it's sort of an interesting choice to make. I don't know what it was that Cal particularly valued that made them choose Madsen rather than Pasternak, if that was even a major consideration, but I find it interesting. We'd have to look at uh, how he fills out his staff too. Like yeah. if, if Madsen brings yeah. in some guy who is AAU connected, you know, Oakland soldiers, Slam and Jam, you know, all the big West Coast programs, um, you know, that could sort of fill up that space pretty easily if, if you're bringing in a recruiter as, as your head assistant. So, um, you know, I think that's probably a question for, you know, later in, in April as he starts to fill out his staff and also looking at, um, I don't know what the next transfer window is, is it? Is it like in June? It's it's happening right now. Oh, okay. I think it closes May 11th, so you could you can enter the portal now. Okay. Um, so yeah, his, as you said, as you, I think that's what you're alluding to. Like what he does in the portal over the next two and a half three weeks is going to be immensely telling, yeah. at least in terms of how he's going to hit the ground running, recruiting high level talent. You know, if he's still recruiting and, and bringing in portal guys that are about the same level that Fox was bringing in then I guess the narrative goes two ways, right? Is one, yeah, he's not going to hit the ground running in terms of recruiting, or two, our name value is so bad that even a new head coach can't ret like just can't ri rinse the the stink off of <laughs> this basketball program right now. So I don't know which it, which it'll be, and I think that also comes down to, yeah, as you said, the assistant coaches and and how he fills that out. We'll have to buy some wingers from Portugal. It's a weird. <laughs> the, I think the weird part here is like he's he's an NBA guy, but he's not he's not an NBA guy or a pro level guy as like the Bill Musgrave type hire, right? Like he's he's been in college ball for a few years now and has been an assistant relatively recently in the NBA. Um so it's like it's it's weird to have his resume here. Yeah, because usually it's like, oh, he's too far removed from college basketball or he's too far removed from being a pro to really look at his pro you know, coaching career as a as a barometer or what he'll what he's going to look to do here or if he really has any connections to the pro level. But like 
both are so relatively new that it's really weird to to look at his resume and go, yeah, he he definitely has connections to modern basketball, and he definitely has connections to modern collegiate basketball. Like, it's it's a re- really weird balance um, looking at his his stops. There's enough in his college resume at Utah Valley that that reassures me that he's not going to be like an NBA mind that doesn't work at the college level. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I've kind of liked as I've looked a little bit more at what he's built at Utah Valley is uh, sort of creativity in terms of roster building and talent identification. Like you're not going to get four star guys to Utah Valley. So like, can you find an intriguing uh, talent that you can build out uh at Utah Valley from like the JC level or from some other, you know, a, a, a portal transfer. Like we haven't really had, uh, uh, well, we've very much not had under Mark Fox, like any sort of roster building creativity other than I guess, like pulling dudes out of Ireland, which is as much as I love our Irish guys, maybe not like the, the, the secret, uh, uh, undiscovered area of talent that, that everybody else has been missing on. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I don't know how he's going to build his Cal roster, but his time at Utah state would indicate to me that he's got some creativity and flexibility to figure out a way to, to make a team that's like comp- at some baseline level of, of competitive in year one. Yeah. I mean, Nick, just to go off of that point, it's like, if you're looking at just that, it it's going to go one or two ways, right? Either his talent like uh, his ability to discern good talent and like pick a, a, out abilities of potential recruits is going to translate to the next tier of athletes that he's able to recruit from. And that's the best case scenario here is, is that translation happens and he's ad- able to identify um, talent, whether that be five stars and go in on per- some like particular guys that he really wants but the flip side of that is he relies too heavily on his tenure at Utah State and only consistently goes for guys that are maybe two diamonds in the rough field and doesn't necessarily make that talent acquisition step in identifying the next level of guys that we need and just like blindly thinking, look, if I can develop the guys that even I had at Utah State, I can compete in the Pac-12. And that was kind of... Mark Fox's downfall with recruiting, right? It's like, I'm just going to bring in the guys that I think are good enough and I will coach them up. And mm-hmm. it clearly did not work out that way. Yeah. You got to mix in some four star guys at the Pac 12 level. Yeah. And you, you can, you can mix in the creative diamonds and the rough guys, but you got to have some four star talent at some point. You got to have the horses. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else or on, uh, just the hiring itself and Mart on Matt. Yeah, I have one more thing. Like, um, I have a personal bias towards <laughs> players who uh, bench players turning into coaches. Um, like, I feel like, yeah. like if you played a super high level basketball, which you obviously did, but you weren't a superstar, you know that allows you to sort of sit there and watch how you know Phil Jackson or Stan, uh, you know Jeff Van Gundy or whomever handles their team but as a guy who made it almost to the top level but then was at the bottom of the top level you sort of both understand both what it takes to get to the top level but also understand what the guy at the end of the bench is thinking and doing and so um yeah. i feel like you know phil jackson is an example of that um you know van gundy was a was a bench sitter at yale so maybe he understands that but like i really like that sort of um i made it to the very top of the nba but i was not a very good nba player that sort of profile as a coach for me that seems like oh like it it gives you sort of the wide range of understanding what what it takes to get to the top level of basketball but also understanding what the sort of like how do i make small improvements at the at the edges to to get as much playing time as possible and not just rely on just naturally being better than everybody else 
So I really like that profile a lot. So you're a Davis Webb fan, huh? <laughs> Quarterback. Well, um, what's his name? Uh, Kenny, um, the the Buffalo Bills uh, QB coach uh, that we did not recruit, even though he lived in Moraga and almost won a Heisman at, at Miami. Um, Ken Dorsey. Ken Dorsey, Ken Dorsey, Ken Dorsey yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. One other uh, parting thought I'll throw out there. This is not necessarily like on-court basketball related. I guess one of them are like two things that I'm happy that we'll we'll see changing that has doesn't really impact wins and losses. Um, one is Madsen's just he's not going to have the slowest paced team in the country. Like I don't <laughs> yeah. know if I don't know if he's gonna really run it in year one. Like, I don't know if we'll go actually up-tempo, but we'll just be like a normal offense in terms of pace. And, and so even if we lose, it'll just be like less deathly boring and like yep. if we fall behind, it won't feel like we're screwed. Um, the other thing, completely off the court, Mark Fox was not interested in doing anything media relations-wise or letting his players do anything media relations-wise. Um, it's really sad, like separate from the losing, like, I got the sense that Kwani Kwani, for example, was like a really interesting, engaging guy with an interesting, engaging story. And we heard nothing about it because none of the players were ever allowed to say anything to the media outside of like a two minute hit about the game. I don't think that Mark Madsen is going to put a lid on the program the way Mark Fox did. And I don't, you know, I want the guys to win, but like if I'm going to be engaged day to day, I want to, you know, root for the guys as people too. And I have a feeling we will actually get to know our players as people. And that makes it a lot more fun and satisfying to root for them to understand the trouble, the, the difficulties when they're losing to celebrate the, the joys when they win. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to not having a brick wall built around the program by somebody who hates having to deal with the media. But that was also facilitated by, I uh, hate to say it, full circle here, you know, the, the powers that be, Knowlton, et cetera, right? Um, yeah. So I'm hoping all of that changes, to your point. Yeah, because I'd love love to break that down a little bit. And I will ask next week at the press conference, what are your plans for pace? Can you give s- some optimism to, to the Cal fans out there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, my, my, my podcast thing that I wanted to do for the longest time, for like a good two-year span, was get – um, Coin Dang and Kwani Kwani on a pod together because they're they're both from the same place. Like they're both good friends here. Um, I, I asked I asked Coin Dang once about Kwani Kwani and and Coin was like, yeah, he's probably the only person I know that's actually taller than me and gets to ride shotgun because usually <laughs> I'm the guy that's the tallest and gets to ride shotgun, uh, which I thought was hilarious. Um, but I never got that opportunity. Um, because they would not, they would just not let players talk to the media during the off season. Um, so I mean, e- I really do hope that. Changes. Yeah, even like the women's basketball team does a really good job of sort of showcasing, uh, yeah. you know, what the players are like mm-hmm. off the court, even if it's controlled sort of hits on social media. That stuff is a lot of fun, and like, yeah, you know, I felt like I was much better connected with our women's players. Just seeing them off the court, getting off the bus, you know, making even though their win loss percentage was was not so good, it felt like they were much more of a of a full time Cal student. Just being able to see what they were doing off the court and dancing and having fun, um, you know, that that was really enjoyable to see glimpses into their lives. Um, and I just like a little bit looser, uh, you know, part around the men's team, you know, just to see, like Nick said who they are as human beings. Look, the, the but, uh, go ahead, Don. Well, so the one thing I'm excited about, changing the topic slightly here, and this has been interesting how this has evolved this afternoon. There was a tweet just posted where basically James Worthy called yep. Mark Matson on the air, right, to congratulate him on the job. We've seen Clay Thompson mention the hire, obviously all the other NBAs. This is interesting. I think unexpected, at least on my part, like there's actual buzz on this a little bit. I'm hoping that translates to a couple celebrity sightings, you know, curiosity seekers at Haas uh, next year. And I'm hoping the place is alive, even potentially in a 500 ish or worse season. I'm, I'm 
optimistic because there seems to be legitimate like interest and buzz from all levels of basketball on this. And I'm hoping it carries over. Yeah. I mean, uh, what Don's talking about, if you didn't see this, uh, Tim Kawakami tweeted as a, who's the editor for the athletic as a PAC 12 guy, Clay Thompson has been curious about the Cal men's hoop search for a few weeks. Now we both came up with candidates back then. And neither of us said Mark Madsen, but last night Clay gave a huge thumbs up for Madsen at Cal. Yeah. So, so that's, yeah, it's nice. To have it's nice. The energy, the optimistic energy is nice. The two things before we close. All right. <laughs> the, the first one, if you have not seen this yet, gentlemen, the invest and attack motto is no longer on any of Cal <laughs> men's basketball's social media pages. Free at last. But, but my dividends. <laughs> <laughs> I made a joke today in our Discord that Mark Fox probably invested in Silicon Valley Bank, but you know, <laughs> it's, and he needed to get bailed out, which he got bought out. So, All my know. apes are gone. <laughs> There's some F. Some of the FTX jokes also write themselves and all that as well. It, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. But the the actual new motto that they've put in, and I don't know if this is the actual motto. Hopefully, it is. But currently, it reads: "Play for the Bay, fight for California." It's been what people have been it begging. Stupid. It's what people have been begging for. Like <laughs> we should be, you know, across all programs, the the program of the Bay Area. I mean, the Raiders are gone. The A's, you know, less said about them, the better. Um, you know, all of the East Bay has no sports program um, except for the right. Roots, and yeah, you know, we should be the most dominant sports program in all the Oakland high schools, in all the East Bay high schools, um, and like getting people to come out and support Cal, even if they didn't attend the school. It's a start. Yeah. Also uh, what Don was saying about James Worthy calling Matt, Mark Madsen live on the air. It's actually on Twitter. Like there's actually the video clip of him um, in, cause he's one of the guys in the studio for the Lakers. So it's actually, it's actually a real like clip. <laughs> it's, this is hilarious. Uh, but yes, no more investing in attacking and, <laughs> more of fighting um all right gents the last thing i want to ask you guys before we we close this out is what are your predictions or expectations for let's say year one of mark madsen year three and year five i'm assuming this is a five-year deal we don't know the details yet we'll probably put in um an foia for it so we can get the details on the contract um and you know do the breakdown financially of it but we gave Mark Fox a five-year. We gave Viking Jones a five-year. I don't think we're not going to give um, Mark Madsen a five-year. So we'll go one, three, five. Anyone want to start? I hope for 12 wins next year, 12 to 14 wins. And just to look like a basketball team again. Um, you know, as, <laughs> as Don said, aesthetically, like, you know, we, you know, it was so much of like, probing and not even like doing anything about like you know one of the things i watched about utah valley that like was you know after a year of watching cal is their players were looking at the basket when they caught the ball and so many cal players would catch the ball and look for the next pass and not even turn towards the basket and say do i have an open shot there, there was no decision making it was just looking for the next handoff looking for the next handoff so i would like to look for, like a basketball team next year you know, get to, you know, this roster, not great, but they should be at least a, you know, a double digit win roster, depending on, on, um, our non-conference games. Um, I'd like to see us in the 12 win and then three years, maybe a bubble team and then five years solidly an NCAA team, top eight seed somewhere, top 32. I am very confident that Mark Madsen can get this team to a baseline level of, of competitiveness, which like for a power five team would be over 500 overall 500 in the conference, you know, at least getting to the NIT um, on it in an average year. The question is how quickly he gets us there and whether or not he's capable of something higher than that, like, you know, a regular NCAA tournament team or can on a, in a good year, can he get us a high seed type of a, a guy? I, I don't, I don't have a good sense of that, but you know, 
I feel confident that, you know, we'll get to, we'll get, presuming that we can get some talent in through the portal, that we can get to double digit wins in year one, get into, you know, well above 500 in year two, 500 in the Pac-12 in year three, something like that. Year five, I do not have the guts to put a prediction down because I just don't know what, I don't know how to start grading what Madsen's ceiling is. I'm going to answer it slightly differently by doing a comparison to, to the other programs in the conference a little bit here um, okay. in relation to maybe what their expectations are. So I look at like the, obviously you've got the top tier of most likely Cronin and Lloyd, right? And, and Altman is up there. So uh, Enfield is questionable whether he's quite there quite yet. Um, so I think we can be in that next tier down. In other words, our range can be in any year, an Arizona State-ish kind of range this year of are we fourth place or are we ninth place? Um, and so a little bit of volatility as we, to your point, Nick, like baseline of 500-ish uh, as a baseline of consistency, then with some peaks above that, probably some valleys too over time. Um, but yeah, like coming in, like if I rank the tiers right now, we, you know, Madsen probably puts us solidly in, you know, I probably think right off the bat, he's probably better than Kyle Smith and probably better than Tinkle, um, uh, and better than Haas, right? And probably better than Hopkins, at least as far as upside coming into next year. And then, <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, and then is he Hurley, right? You know, Hurley's got some weaknesses. Uh, so yeah, to me, that's where I'm like, he is solidly, we could have any year a variance of fourth place to ninth place. Um, and I'm, I'm okay with that as a one, one to three year kind of roadmap. Um, and like like Nick, I'm not. I'm scared to kind of commit to anything beyond beyond a three year window at this point in time. <laughs> I think that those are all reasonable takes. Um, I think mine. I only have one want or expectation for year one, is that we win at Stanford. <laughs> I I I just need to be there to see it. I need to be there to see it when. The Stanford fans realized that their own player beat their head coach that they should have fired last year. Uh, if, Mark the lesser, if Mark the Lesser can do it, then surely Mark the Greater can. <laughs> yeah, didn't Fox Fox had a winning record against Stanford, didn't he? Uh, f- five and five, exactly five. Okay. Right. No, Viking did though. Viking had a winning. I think Viking had a winning record against Stanford because he beat that, him in the tournament too. Yeah, that That's could right. be. He might have been three and two. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what a wild world we live in. Uh, Extend yeah, that man, want. Jared Haas, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is the, the best benefit is the, the rending of shirts at Stanford right now. Yeah, I think that – and weirdly, BYU fans are upset too. Maybe it's the, the LDS stuff, but um, – Yeah, I think weirdly, they saw BYU him. BYU fans maybe, are upset. So. Are they thinking they're going to lose Pope? Is that the idea? Well, they were like – they were like, why are you taking the Cal job? You should have just waited until we fired Pope or he left and, you know, you could have taken the BYU gig. Why are you going to the, the Pac-12 that's disintegrating? Because, you know, they're all happy because they're going to the Big 12. And, yeah, so. but he's coming home. Also, the right? cultural really opposite weird. of BYU, too. I think that might have something to do with the, you know, the devil liberal hippies. Yeah. Because yeah. um, we, we, we heard that a lot while we played them in the Vegas Bowl, too. Yeah. Mm. But and Marshawn ran all over their face. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, we beat them in Provo, too. It's not that it's long true. ago that we beat yeah. them in Provo with what's it? Ashton Davis's hit from years from eons past <laughs> and Brandon McElwain running rampant all over their defense. That's right. That was the Brandon McElwain. <laughs> that was the that Brandon was McElwain Super coming Nova game. That was yeah. a pretty ugly game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's that's it, folks. That's our that's our spiel on Mark Madsen, the hiring. Of course, I'll probably get you guys on to do another one once the coaching bench is finalized, and then also uh, some news through the portal happens. And we, <coughs> excuse me, and then we bring in some guys, and we'll see kind of what the roster looks like. Of course, we also don't know who's leaving at this point. Um, the three seniors are all in the portal with Kwani and, and Joel and Lars. Sam just entered the portal. Um, but it does bode a little bit nicely on at least looking at Instagram, like Devin, 
um, Marcellus. was very was very happy about the the hiring and you know had some bear emojis. Mar- I think Marcellus replied in the comments too with some like go bear stuff. Um, so yeah, there's some there's some good uh, there's some good buzz right now, and we'll see what the roster shape looks like in a few weeks. But once again, thank you, gents, uh, for joining. This is the California Golden Bear Cast. Uh, you can find us on all of your listening platforms, wherever you can find all of our written stuff, uh, including Nick's in memorandum and in <laughs> of uh, of Mark Fox, and then of course uh, also of the new Mark Madsen hire as well. Um, Don writes everywhere, but we'll see him more probably after Monday when we go to that when we go to that presser press right? conference. Yep, press yeah. conference on Monday, and then uh, and then everything else uh, you can find at rightforcalifornia dot com. We're in the midst of spring football, so you can get all our practice notebooks and all that stuff if you're a subscriber. And as the new basketball motto goes, we're going to use that as the ending phrase today. Play for the Bay, play for California. And as always, go Bears. Go Bears. Go Bears. Go Bears.